We're advancing into a future that's taking new shape every day. What will our world look like in 50 years? From the automated cities and flying cars, will our children have artificial organs? Will they live to be a Top international scientists in a half a century ahead are discovering The good news is, we're going to see some amazing medical breakthroughs. Therapies which today are considered impossible could become commonplace in the future. But there's also bad news. The flip side is, if you think that the healthcare system today has too much control over your life, then just wait for the next 50 years. This story from the future begins with Alain Degas. He's a twice divorced doctor, and last night he celebrated his birthday with friends in Paris. Hi, Princess! Bye. One fact that distinguishes his life today. completely from today. It's Daddy's birthday. It's ever present today. and always working. It's Daddy's but birthday. It's Daddy's birthday. It's Daddy's birthday. It's Daddy's birthday. The home of tomorrow is intelligent today. and thinks ahead. But the computer said you weren't going to be here until this afternoon. But this will have to wait. I gotta get to the clinic. Now? Sorry, Princess. But you can thank Dr. Balzac for that. She takes my dream job. Now she's my boss, and today I get to smile and pretend I like it. I'll fix her something quick. So you're sure she wasn't just better than you? Better than me? Is there life on Mars? Alan's house has electronic eyes, ears, and even a kind of nose which tests his breath. Caution. Alcohol level. Mini computers and sensors organize and protect his life. A secretary and a security system all in one. Let's keep this between us. But it's not just his house that casts the caring look of Anna. The computer chips in his flat are networked with the whole city. Right now, the house is ordering out a food and taxi. At the same time, another very powerful organization has access to the apartment systems. Health insurance companies like Personal Care compile electronic personal files on their patients, monitoring their lives in extraordinary Next. detail. Next. The aim is to avoid costs through preventive care and Wait, diagnostic Wait, mucous tests. membrane of the mouth? Send health memo immediately. Bonjour, Monsieur Descartes. Here are a few more tips for your dental care. Brush your teeth regularly using the ultrasound toothbrush. If you'll give away the fact that Alan was partying last night and his premiums will go up as a result. Thanks for your attention. You must be joking. Actually, Anna should be pleased about all this high-quality care because he's had heart problems from birth. Can I go with you? No, it's not your speed. Just a bunch of boring grown-ups. Now, don't pout. I won't be long. Now, please, give me my jacket. You know I need it. Anna's jacket is crucial for his health because it continuously monitors the state ah, of his heart. Thank you. Get the car, please. Alan's clothing looks quite ordinary, but that's deceptive because woven inside the fabric are dozens of tiny computer chips and sensors monitoring his health. When he puts on his clothing, he goes online. Now get this. If he's ever knocked unconscious, his clothes will automatically identify his coordinates, alert the authorities, and upload his entire medical history before the ambulance arrives. In the future, you will have a doctor in your clothing. And that may happen within 10 years. Your clothes will be transmitting data around the clock, and they'll send warnings when something is wrong. The man who invented intelligent clothing wants to make bulky ECG kits and blood pressure testers a thing of the past. One of the most important things when we were designing the smart shirt was the ultimate integration between sensing, communication, and clothing. It sounds simple, but the devil's in the detail. The great challenge for the scientists in Atlanta was how to weave the intelligent components into the fabric. Wires and computer chips would have to disappear into the material. Yeah. 
years for the crude prototypes to become the world's first woven computer. This fabric can now carry gigabytes of information. So let's say I'm an athlete who's training for my Olympics or any particular sport, then I can monitor my heart rate, for instance, using the shirt. And so the information will go from there to this, there'll be a controller here, and from here the information will be transmitted to the uh, point where you want to collect the data. Today, the sensors and the power supply are still clipped on and disconnected when the garment is washed. So this invention is not yet ready for everyday use. But researchers across the world are working to make the idea viable. In 10 years' time, these high-tech garments will be powered by our movements and our body heat, and the software they contain will look after our well-being like a private nurse. They won't transmit all the information they gather. The system will check for danger signs and disturbing symptoms. Changes in heart rhythm, a sudden drop in blood pressure, or even the early warning signs of a heart attack, like a dangerously blocked artery, will in future be transmitted directly to the nearest emergency medical center. Fifty years from now, everybody, from little babies to senior citizens, will be wearing this kind of clothing that can enhance the quality of life for them. And in fact, uh, if a person is involved in an accident, that can actually save their life. But the omniscient home and the medical clinics will protect our future selves from stress. Taxis at the door, Alan's late, he's in a rush, and he doesn't notice the busy little clean. Clearance for ambulance. Initiate cause analysis. Alert hospital. Back. Seconds later, personal care has informed the nearest Down. hospital and dispatched the high speed ambulance of the future. As a kid, I used to watch Flash Gordon on TV and dream about having my own personal flying car. But you know, there are problems with that dream. Even for helicopters, they're bulky, expensive, and tricky to fly. And flying cars have always been problematic. But engineers are now solving those practical problems. And NASA scientists envision the day when we will look up and see a superhighway in the sky. No one has dreamt of flying cars longer than Paul Muller. And no one knows better than him how hard it is to make them work. A good flying car is a vehicle that does a number of things. Takes off vertically like a helicopter, flies at high speed like an airplane, and drives for some distance on the road like an automobile. powerful lightweight engines, you have to have uh, materials that are particularly strong. All of these technologies are coming along at this time. Moller didn't give up. The tip, so what this he built surveillance drones for the army and mufflers for cars, so that he could finance a new flying machine. One that would really fly. The new machine needed power. He tried four jet engines. After 15 years of setbacks and occasional glimmers of hope, his dream was ready, parked in his garage. Nine hundred and fifty horsepower for a weight of seven hundred kilos. Theoretically, it could streak through the sky at six hundred kilometers an hour, if it took off at all. The first test flight. 
people get concerned because they got this vision of all kinds of vehicles up in the air but actually if you took all the cars on the road in America today and put them there they'd still be miles apart but uh, you'll see a computerized world where you're not flying it you're just sitting you're playing computer games you're reading uh, you're sleeping doing whatever as you're delivered from point A to point B. NASA is already working on a management system for private air traffic. Programmers have developed software for private pilots that aims to make flying as easy as driving a car. The routes are displayed in the cockpit navigation system, just like roads. NASA has given it the catchy name, Highway in the Sky. The Highway in the Sky system gives you a lot of confidence that you really are where you're supposed to be. And it just makes you feel more comfortable, and then you fly better. Guy runs a test on the simulator to show just how well the program performs. Hey, Guy. Copy. Yeah, I can hear you, Jason. Guy is a computer programmer and has never piloted an aircraft before. They make it harder for him by introducing wind turbulence. But Guy can steer just as if he were on a road and has no problem maintaining altitude and direction. But intelligent highways in the sky won't be enough if hundreds of thousands of cars are aloft at the same time. Most likely, all planes will soon be steered automatically by satellite transmissions to prevent accidents and aerial traffic jams. The engineer's biggest concern is the landing. No machine has yet equaled the skills of an experienced pilot. It's fairly easy to keep the plane flying relatively straight and level, but as you get closer to the ground, that's where the accidents happen. So the industry is now developing an automatic landing system that will work without pilots and without air traffic controllers. Runways will be laced with tiny computer chips, which will transmit exact approach details to incoming planes, and will even factor in weather conditions and any other special obstacles. A program in the in-flight computer will then land the plane. Imagine a future where this advanced navigation system could be linked with the autopilot to make the aircraft autonomous enough to fly from where it knows it is to where it knows I want to go. And you can imagine a day when an aircraft like that is used for search and rescue, to help your friend Alon. In 50 years, flying ambulances should save emergency doctors and paramedics precious time. No traffic events. Patient data registered. Alan Dega. Platinum class confirmed. Loss of blood, 35%. I suggest reversible death. Okay. If, like a man, the victim has lost a lot of blood, there is a risk of cardiac arrest and oxygen shortage to arrive. The doctors have just 10 minutes to stabilize his condition. He has virtually no chance of survival. After a serious accident or a heart attack, every second brings us closer to death. So wouldn't it be great if somehow we could stop the clock? In the future, EMTs will use a technique called reversible death or suspended animation. They will replace your blood with an ice cold saline solution, dropping body temperature to 50 degrees Fahrenheit when brain and heart activity come to a halt. This technique is now being tested in the laboratory and one day could save your life. With his body thus cool, Alan can safely be transported to the hospital of the future. Later, when the doctors have closed his wounds, he'll get his blood back and be returned to consciousness. Sorry for calling you away from your party. Never hesitate. This is more important than cocktails. Start the gun. Before the operation, his injuries are thoroughly examined. New diagnostic techniques reveal a lot more than broken bones and internal injuries. The body scan will also flag up abnormalities like tiny tumors or narrowing arteries. Diagnosis? Suspended animation, no brain activity, abnormal cardiac function, heavy compound fractures, contusion of the spine, paraplegia likely. 
Not looking good. Okay, let's get started. Insert the sensors. With this injection, Anna's recovery takes a big new step. It contains microscopic electrodes that attach themselves to the nerves in his muscles. About 150 electrodes are needed to build up an intelligent network in his body. The signals are gathered by computer chips along the spinal column and transmitted to a chip they are about to implant in Anna's brain. Then Anna will be able to walk again. What in the world? Next layer. Last time I saw an artificial heart was in 2040. This one's even made of real polymers. Looks like it took a hit. It's tearing near the energy cell. Clear case for a new heart. How's he insured? Platinum. Good for him. He'd stick up. Oh my gosh. Your biggest rival. Only yesterday he was ripping you apart. What happened? He was banking on getting the job. Well, he's my patient now. I'll need a tissue sample for the new heart before we bring him round. Okay. A week from now, this cell sample will have become a medical miracle. Meantime, Alan is recovering from his operation in the luxury of the first class section of the hospital. If today's predictions turn out to be accurate, he'll be paying almost half his income for this premium service. You have a daughter? This may come as a shock to you, but there are people who have a life outside the clinic. Listen, Degas, Please, let's Dr. Just... Belzac, just tell me how it looks. Your left thigh's been fractured and your hip is dislocated. Two ribs and a second lumbar vertebra are also fractured. But you have a bigger problem. Let me see. I am a doctor, please. Your artificial heart has fishes. You're gonna open me up? You need a new heart. The print's already in progress. It'll only take another 20 hours. You're not carving me up. Not you. As you wish. Doctor. Scan identified. Marie Balzac. Status. Cleared for security zone. Have a nice evening. Meanwhile, in the hospital's top security department of genetic medicine, Alain's cell samples have developed in new ways. In a series of complex steps, the stem cells have been transformed into eight different kinds of heart cell and cultured billions of times over in a nutrient solution. In the future, this technology could solve one of medicine's biggest problems. A simple comparison makes the point. If your car gets banged up in a car accident, what do you do? You go to the body shop and get a new door or fender. But if you happen to be in that same accident, you could die. Now consider this. In Europe alone, there are 40,000 patients on the waiting list for an organ transplant. And of them, 10 people die every day for lack of an organ. What we need is a human body shop. And in 50 years, tissue engineering could change everything. Tissue engineering actually means growing tissues. No one yet knows how to grow a whole organ, but many doctors and researchers are working on different elements of the task. Stefan Jochenhoeven is the first person to try culturing a biological heart valve. It's a huge challenge. A healthy heart valve lives through 3 billion heartbeats and has to pump 250 million liters of blood. Tissue engineering is now a relatively young discipline and very exciting. It's so the way that we finally from engineering, really from the mechanical parts, in the things ever further. Ähm, zu biologisieren, wie man das schön sagt. Einfach Fremdmaterial schrittweise ersetzen durch ein körpereigenes Material. Every heart valve that Jochen Hövel grows is made to measure. First, a mold is crafted. This will be a child's heart valve. Now the valve is cast, as the doctors put it. And that happens in two stages. First, a solution of heart cells and protein is poured into the mold. The substance is added that works on protein links like the instant meal. Just one hour later, the tissue is stable enough to open the mold and gently peel out the valve. But it's still not finished. It's put in a bioreactor to accustom it to the constant beat of a heart. At body temperature, the 
Zellen sind von Natur aus faul. Entsprechend äh, ist es wichtig, nicht nur diese Klappen zu züchten, zu gießen, sondern wirklich dann auch zu trainieren, das, was wir im Biorektorsystem machen, ähnlich an Fitnessstudios, dass die Zellen das tun, was sie tun sollen. Jochen Hövel reckons it will be another 10 years before his heart valves will be beating inside a human body. Organic spare parts made to order. But you could never make a complete human heart this way. The arrangement of the billion cells involved is simply too complex. So researchers are looking for a different way to build this miracle of organic engineering, cell by cell. Biologists and engineers in the US had an idea that sounds crazy. To use the good old inkjet printer that creates each letter of the hundreds of tiny ink dots. Why shouldn't it work with cells? We didn't change much, first of all. Um, this is a conventional inkjet printer and so what we do is we change the cartridge quite a lot, we take the ink out, we'll modify it so it can accommodate our cells, and we rinse it and so on and sterilize it as well. Um, this is one thing. The other thing is where the paper feeds, usually we use a special bio paper, a kind of a gel, and so we had to um, modify it a little bit over there so it can accommodate for that paper. The first test was to write the name of the university in bacteria. There were two critical questions. Would the bacteria survive the printing process? And how precise would the result be? The research team had an anxious six-hour wait before they could see the results. Well, what we see is the pattern that we printed previously, uh, the green light is just the fluorescence of the cells and that shows basically that we did two things. One is the cells were printed where we wanted them to be printed and second is the cells divided so they survived the printing process. The next stage was even more critical. Boland adapted the printer so it would build three-dimensional structures, living tissue made from animal heart cells. What we see here are a couple of layers of heart cells that we printed using our printers. And what we want to do eventually is to print an entire heart. Uh, we may achieve this in 50 years or so, but uh, there are a number of things to overcome. The uh, ability to print capillaries, for example. But if we overcome those obstacles, and I think we will, then this could quite be possible. Even the immune system, our body's firewall, would be formed by organic printed spare parts made from our own cells. Tissue rejection will be a thing of the past. But Marie has other things on her mind. Patient Colonel. Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to apologize for earlier. I... I guess I'm just a sore loser. You are the biggest little boy I have ever met. Diagnosis confirmed, Doctor. <laughs> I have to go. The night shift's always understaffed. When are you working tomorrow? Night. Tomorrow afternoon I'll be busy partying. Egg and spoon races, pin the tail on the donkey. It's my son's eighth birthday. There is life beyond the clinic, you know. <laughs> hey, they just Scorpio. Just like me.
days before Alan's heart transplant. Personal care does another review of his case, and the operative comes across an inconsistency. Next. Stop. The information comes from Alain Degas' intelligent apartment. Please include in the record, patient Degas Alain, inconsistent test results. Urine sample from 7.34 a.m. does not match urine sample taken at 12.20 in our hospital. Probability of manipulation, 80%. Request detailed check, groceries, trash, and contents of refrigerator. Suspicion of alcohol. Run. Alan's little trick has caught him out. What a way to celebrate your birthday, Dr. Degas. Uh -huh. Anna, I, I think we should be on a first name basis. Okay. Marie. Anyway. How is my heart coming? Okay, come on, I'll show you. Wait a minute. This is really good. Well, I have to admit, I did make it with real butter and real flour. No. We are sitting on a time bomb, one that could explode in our faces in the coming decades. Quite simply, people, especially in the Western world, are getting too obese and are eating their way to an early grave. In the United States alone, 10% of its annual health budget goes to treating obesity and its effects. Unless this problem can be solved, this could break the bank and sink the economy. However, in the future, bioengineered foods and advanced genetics, they may come to the rescue. But to do that, we must solve one of our body's best kept secrets. Why do we like to eat things that make us fat? Scientists at the Wageningen Center for Nutrition have vowed to find the definitive answer to this question that tortures so many members of the human race. Test subjects are put under observation. Their brain activity is monitored, the reaction of their pupils analyzed, and their blood pressure checked. Without knowing it, this test subject is about to eat a typical low-fat product. This yogurt has just 0.2% fat. Though he hasn't been told, his tongue recognizes the truth instantly. Within seconds, his pulse increases. He's not pleased. This food is unsatisfying. The electrodes reveal interesting changes. They register values that can only be interpreted one way. This is stress. Het lijkt alsof er bij wijze van spreken ons geen al ingebouwd zit dat die signalen als het niet creamy en niet crispy is, maar dan is het vaak ja, lijkt het wel oud en, en bedorven wellicht, dat het onveilig is, dat het niet goed is voor ons. But we seem to be really happy when something feels crispy on our tongue, because crisp equals fresh. And we shouldn't underestimate the effect of an extra portion of fat. 11% fat. Ja, dat is niet ingebeeld. Dat gebeurt dus echt. Helaas zitten er op dit moment in dat voedsel ook heel erg veel calorieën. En we proberen nu nou net dat voedsel te maken op een zodanige wijze dat het je wel helpt ontspannen, maar dat het niet de calorieën levert. So Rob Harmer's team is searching for the magic substance that will fool our sensitive tongue. This device mimics the tasting process, and Harmer is using it to test his latest creation a low-fat pudding combined with an additive. These are extreme close-ups of a tongue. On the left, without the additive, a small amount of fat is distributed in fine bubbles. On the right, we see the additive of It makes the bubbles expand and dissolve, so the tongue tastes a creamy texture with almost zero calories. But perhaps we can trick not just our taste nerves, but our genes themselves. Researchers are working on this vital question all over the world. The puzzle they're trying to solve is one a lot of us would like to have the answer to. Why do some people simply not put on weight? To find out, a team from the University of Maastricht weighed a group of 20 volunteers, analyzed their genes, and calculated their body's fat content. Then they were fed. 
Each one was locked in a cell and given three solid meals a day and all sorts of sweet things in between. The airlock has one great advantage. In a 3 by 4 meter cell, the scientists could constantly check the oxygen and CO2 levels. If oxygen consumption suddenly rose, that would indicate secret physical exercises. much more active than in the case of the lightweights. Their bodies created large amounts of a particular protein. This protein is responsible for the weight increase. Scientists are now looking for a food additive that can act as a break on this genetic fattening. And we hope that in 50 years, with the developments that we do, and for the good of health, that it for people much easier to be not so slim as you are alert. 24 hours before Alain's transplant operation. The last few thousand cells of his new heart are being printed. Tomorrow it should be beating inside his body. Aha, my friend. Degas Alain, suspicion of manipulation confirmed. Cancel insurance coverage immediately. Confirm. Degas Alain, cancel insurance coverage immediately. 18 hours before the operation, a physiotherapist is working on Alain's still paralyzed limbs. Can you move your leg? Okay, Monsieur Descartes. Now I'll activate the chip in your head. In just a few moments, the computer chip in Alain's brain will make contact with the electrodes in his paralyzed legs. Let's practice some walking. Monsieur Degas, let's get started. Now, focus on moving your legs. Ready? Here we go. Just imagine raising your left leg. We all remember the tragedy of Christopher Reeve, the actor who soared into space as Superman, but died helplessly in a wheelchair because of a spinal cord injury. Today, there are hundreds of thousands of patients worldwide like Christopher Reeve who are also paralyzed. But in the future, we will have a computer chip that connects the brain directly to an arm or a leg, bypassing the injured spinal cord, and the paralyzed will walk again. However far away that may seem now, neurologist John Donahue has no doubt it is coming. For 20 years, he's been working with computer experts to analyze the patterns of human movement. He now knows the language of the brain that makes all these movements possible. It consists not of words, but of millions of individual electronic impulses. The smallest act is The long-term goal was to see whether we could mathematically decode or translate the brain's language into something that a computer could understand and use. Matthew Nagel is a former football star, paralyzed from the neck down since he was stabbed. He volunteered for a daring experiment with Dr. Donahue. His greatest wish is to become a little more independent. Matthew agreed to have a chip implanted in his brain. The aim was to use this chip to capture movement impulses deep inside the human brain for the first time. During the surgical procedure, our goal was to put this tiny sensor uh, into the arm area of the motor cortex, the area of the brain where arm signals, arm movement signals are generated. So this tiny platform sat on top of the brain and the electrodes about one millimeter long would then go into the brain to pick up brain signals. So what we had hoped is that we could then record the patterns of brain activity that were still remaining after spinal cord injury. And in particular, we were interested whether just thinking about moving would allow us to drive a computer or other devices. Two weeks after the operation, Matthew tried out the system for the first time. He was linked to a PC, and his job was to move the cursor with just the power of his thoughts. The result was astonishing. I'm going to open the first email, which says congrats. It says you are doing a great job. Now I'm going to the exit. 
Next, I'm going to paint a circle. Matthew's microchip represents a huge medical advance. That's the best circle I can do, and I'm going to act it. But that was just the first step for the research team. Their next generation chips should understand a lot more of the brain's instructions. Now the programmers are concentrating on decoding the signals for hand movements. They use infrared cameras to analyze the movements. If they succeed, paralyzed people will soon be able to direct artificial limbs with their thoughts. Yet the hand is not only the most useful of our body's tools, but also the most complex. 20 joints, whose movements can be combined in millions of ways. Discovering the codes for all of them and translating them for the computer seemed to be impossible. But that would actually be too complicated for the human brain as well. What we find actually is that the human hand can be described by a much lower dimensional representation, about six degrees of freedom. For example, you can't move the joints of your fingers independently. The first and second joint of this index finger move in concert with each other. And what we're searching for is how all the fingers move together in a coordinated fashion to try and uncover the representation the brain might use to move the fingers in that way. Open. Close. Not bad, man. Not bad at all. Close. The hands. I think we're at the beginning of this age of neurotechnology and what I want to see is that we can have a physical repair of the nervous system and what I mean is that someday you'll be sitting here interviewing someone and they'll be moving their hands, they'll be walking around, they'll be talking and they will tell you that I'm in fact spinal cord injured but I've been repaired by a brain gate chip in my motor areas that have reconnected my arms and my legs and I play sports, I, I live a normal life. Now when I let go of you, just think of walking. What are you thinking? What? <laughs> Maybe I should come back in a few minutes. What's the problem? The results for your urine tests before and after the accident don't match up. You manipulated them. I had a few drinks in mind before. I was just trying to keep my premiums down. I'll aren't personal care are refusing to pay a dime. You know what that means. And I. You're not insured. You're not only the biggest child I've ever met, you're also the stupidest. What about the transport? Cancelled. They're going to tell you that the old pump will hold up and in two years you'll get a replacement schedule. But you said it was defective. Monsieur Degas, I'm sorry. This is the lowest class of hospital service. Monsieur Degas, let me help you. For the first time, Anna experiences the real meaning of multi-class medicine. Anyone who's uninsured or underinsured runs the risk of descending into the healthcare underground. I'm Dubois. Afterlife management. I've come to make you an offer. Afterlife management? What kind of an offer? I'm still alive. I'll take a few cell samples. Here. Here right now. And then? And then we'll clone you. And you'll be reborn again. As what? It's only a matter of time, perhaps within a decade before we have human clones. Remember test tube babies? Back in the 70s, people denounced test tube babies as the work of the devil. Well, today we hear the same arguments against clones. Now, clones can be banned, but how do you stop a black market in clones? Maybe you have a rich man with no heirs. What's to stop him from willing all his money to himself as a child and starting all over again? Now, clones raise all sorts of moral issues. Do they have a soul? Do they have rights? Can they sue their genetic counterparts? The debate has just begun. Well, if you do change your mind, please, please, just please give me a call. Alain's first night in the pauper's ward begins. There's no prospect of help. Now the insurance has been cancelled. The hospital should really destroy his freshly printed heart. Several floors above, Anna's fate takes an unexpected turn. Oh, no. A cardiac arrest in platinum class. A 61-year-old patient cannot be alive. Jacques Anna 
Jacques Martin's transplant was scheduled for the next day. Sorry, Jacques Martin. job and then some this is the last time we'll see each other for a long time why listen i'm giving you the insurance tip of a first class patient what have you done he was dead already there's a way to adjust the machine so that he looks like he's still alive to central monitoring are you crazy what are you gonna do with the other guy on paper he'll die two days later i'm going to build the heart to his chip and then operate on and then operate on you as planned tomorrow then i'll switch the chips back to insurance it'll look like he died in surgery What if you get caught? We don't have a choice. Take care, Alain. The next morning, Marie takes a risk that could end her career. She succeeds in slipping Alain into the platinum class operating suite. Brand new, freshly printed heart is ready. Now, who have we got here? Isn't that one of our colleagues? Jacques Martin, 14595, 90 kilograms of platinum level. Heart transplant with engineered organ. Can you believe he's 62 years old? He's in good shape, Monsieur Jacques Martin. Concentration, please. Everyone ready? Patient hypertherm. Marie will not touch the patient once during the operation. Body temperature 46 degrees. Blood completely replaced with plasma solution. She works on a virtual 3D model of Alain's body, which she can enlarge at will. She changes instruments using a computer menu. Stop. Computer rejecting data. Seems like we've got the wrong patient. There we go. Piece of technology junk. No kidding. In years to come, high-definition images like this from inside the body will revolutionize surgical techniques. One click and the scalpel becomes a sword. While Marie opens the virtual patient's ribcage, the robot arms carry out the real incision on her more precisely than any human being could. But in 50 years, we will still need surgeons. They will never be replaced. Are all the main arteries blocked? Yes, you can remove the organ. Fifty years ago, some scientists predicted that robots will push the human out of the operating room. Well, that may never happen because every patient is different. Robots cannot anticipate the unexpected. They cannot adjust to new operating strategies. So for you parents out there, hoping that your kids become doctors, keep on saving money for medical school. In the future, there will be surgeons in the operating room. And it's going to be the human-machine partnership that will perform miracles in the hospital. Even today, there are hundreds of routine operations that would have seemed impossible just a few decades ago. At this hospital in Leipzig, in Germany, more than 3,000 open-heart operations are carried out every year, magnifying spectacles and precision instruments. The incisions are getting smaller and smaller to improve recovery times, but even experienced surgeons are now reaching their limits. The Jurok arbeitet sehr feingliedrig, extrem präzise, aber auch diese Präzision ist für moderne chirurgische Techniken nicht unbedingt ausreichend. Es ist notwendig, wenn wir im Inneren des Patienten mit langen Instrumenten operieren, Millimeter- oder Submillimeter genaue Bewegungen durchzuführen. Das heißt, wir brauchen Instrumente, die die natürlichen Fähigkeiten der Hände aufgreifen und in den Körper des Patienten bringen. 
This surgical robot is being tested in Leipzig. Its scalpels and tweezers are just a few millimeters in length. It's being used in a bypass operation on a pig's heart. A steering console transmits the surgeon's hand movements to the miniature instruments. The slim robot arms have one great advantage. They make open heart keyhole surgery possible. One of the arms supports a camera filming the site of the operation while the surgeons cut millimeter by millimeter. A hydraulic system makes the surgeon's hand movements smaller. Each movement of the scalpel is just one-fifth of the surgeon's original action. Manipulations that were too fine for human hands have now become possible. There's still one problem with the system. If the doctor makes a mistake, the robot does too. But even that could soon change. The Leipzig surgeons are working with engineers to develop an emergency brake to prevent mistakes in the operating theater. The first stage is to provide a position marker for the instruments. The patient is fitted with an infrared sensor. Then the surgeons can outline exactly which areas they intend to work on using a virtual 3D model on their computer. Danger zones are marked off limits. Next, the computer is linked to another infrared camera that's constantly monitoring the positions of the instrument and the patient. A symbol representing the patient lights up to give the go-ahead when all systems are linked up and running. In a real operation, every millimeter would be critical. Using a normal drill, the smallest shake of the surgeon's hand could damage sensitive nerves and could paralyze the patient's face forever. But this system watches over the surgeon's every move. If he gets too close to the limits of the operative area outlined in blue, the emergency brake cuts in. The instrument is switched off before nerves or arteries can be damaged. Solche Systeme werden in der Lage sein, beispielsweise zitternde Handbewegungen oder sehr hektische Bewegungen auszufiltern und in eine ruhige Bewegung des Assistenzsystems zu übersetzen, sodass man davon ausgehen kann, dass Marie trotz ihrer aktuellen Anspannung in der Lage sein wird, Anna fachgerecht zu versorgen. We're running out of time. The vibrant glue will harden in five seconds. Fiber and glue solid. Okay. Unblock the main arteries. All open. Can I revascularize him? Yes. Inject his own blood. Quickly, please. Injecting. 2.5 liters per minute. Two channels. It's not beating. Come on, come on. It's taking too long. Don't give up. He's got only 20 seconds left. Come back. Blood pressure okay? I'll stabilize him. Please close the thorax. If 
I can afford all these high-tech treatments, I personally wouldn't mind living to be the ripe old age of 200 years to see beyond my years, to see the future of the human race. And how about you? Well, one thing we know for sure, hold on to your hats because in the next 50 years, it's going to be a wild ride.